Welcome to the first self-hosted SharkFest US. And by that, I mean, this is, this is the first year that we are hosting SharkFest under the Wireshark Foundation, which is a nonprofit that we set up for you know, Wireshark and for SharkFest and for you know, protocol analysis in general. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Um, you know, we're, we're really far into the lifetime of the project and, and a good question would be, you know, how did we get here and why, you know, why it took so long? And, and uh, um, we got here, I, I would love to say that we got here through some grand vision that either I or Sherry or Janice had um, and that we executed it perfectly and flawlessly and everything went right. But as you can see by the quote up here on the screen, we, we kind of learned by doing. We, we, um, I, I love this quote. It's by Niels Bohr, physicist. Uh, I remember reading it years ago when I was in college, and, and uh, um, it's stuck with me forever. You know, it says an expert is a person who has made all the mistakes that can be made in a narrow, very narrow field. And it, it's true. It rings true. Uh, if you've been in any sort of field long enough, and if you ask anybody here that's been working in networking long enough, that uh, they'll tell you, they'll probably gladly tell you what mistakes they've made in their career. And uh, um, mistakes can be useful, you know, as long as there's, you can contain the damage, <laughs> you know, and make it, keep it minor. Uh, mistakes can be useful. You can learn from them. Uh, and you, mistakes are often a better teaching tool than, than, you know, just reading abstract theoretical knowledge because mistakes give you this very visceral, immediate feedback that sticks with you. And so, you know, you're, you're gonna make mistakes no matter what. The, 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 the thing that you have to do is to learn to learn from them and, and help those mistakes and guide you to the right path and guide you where you actually do need to go. Um, I find mistakes are useful because they keep me humble and, uh, you know, not to get too arrogant because, uh, you know, I'll you know, start doing something and think, well, okay, am I getting ahead of myself here? Let's figure out, you know, let's make sure that this is not you know, going down the wrong path. Um, I've made mistakes in my career. There, there are three up here that kind of stick out. I, I see that there's some football fans in the crowd. Years ago, I was working in an ISP. It's the same ISP where I did, you know, ultimately developed Ethereal. But for whatever reason, we had an awesome sales team. And um, it was in Kansas City where I grew up, and we managed to land the Chiefs website uh, and, and a whole bunch of other websites. But one day our lead developer came in and asked me, I was the you know, head system administrator, and he asked me if I could write a script that would clean up this directory full of cache files. And some of you are nodding your head and they know exactly where I'm going with this. But it's a, you know, conceptually it's a very simple thing. Um, if you're on a Unix system, you use the find command to find files that are older than a certain date and you know, a certain amount of time in this directory and just delete them. Um, the mistake I made was that I forgot to give the find command a starting directory. The find command, if you don't give it a starting directory, says, let's just use your home directory. Uh, we were running on Solaris, and I was running as root, so the root user's home directory was the top level of the file system. Um, it deleted all the, you know, it just deleted all the files on the system. They're older than, what, eight or 12 hours. I forget what the timeout was. And so, yeah, I deployed the script, didn't think much about it, and a little later, while later, uh, one of my coworkers came into you know, our shared office space and said, websites are down. And I thought, well, that's not right. So I checked, and sure enough, they were. And I realized exactly what had happened, you know, after, you know, looking at things. And uh, luckily, I was very diligent, and I'm still very diligent about keeping backups. Again, you learn from your mistakes. I, I learned that, yeah, you got to have backups no matter what. And so I got to spend the rest of the day and kind of early into the evening restoring from uh, these really slow, stupid exabyte tapes, but that's what we had at the time. And I got everything, you know, I got everything re restored. And so, you know, no, no data was actually lost, fortunately, but, uh, you know, it was kind of stressful that, that day. Uh, and another, at another point in my career, I was working at a consulting company and we had a data center and I was asked to set up monitoring for our core network. You know, pretty standard thing to do. We had a bunch of standard tools to do that with. And at the time, to do, you know, to monitor network devices, you used SNMP. You kind of still do nowadays. And so I, I 
you know, had set up all these graphs of, of you know, bytes in and out and packets in and out and what's up and down and stuff, and that was useful but kind of boring too. So I thought, well, I can pull a whole bunch of other SNMP data. Let's see what's, what's on this router and what's useful. And so I did an SNMP walk and, and got some data, and I noticed it was skipping over some tables, and that annoyed me. So I was a little bit more aggressive in my SNMP walking and started pulling down everything I could from the router. And, and again, a little while later, Coworker walks into our shared office space and says, hey, is the internet down? And uh, uh, as it turned out, the, the aggressive SNMP walking caused the router to tell me it's the contents of its BGP tables. And so instead of routing, it was telling me all about routing. And, uh, um, and the irony, of course, is that I was asked to monitor our network and I ended up taking it down. Um, so I shut down the script and everything came back up, so okay. Uh, the the, the thir third thing I want to talk about mistake-wise is um, the one at the bottom. I started an open source project. That wasn't the mistake. Uh, a few months later, my wife and I bought a house. That was also not a mistake. The mistake was um, at, at that point in the project, which was called Ethereal, I was I was the source code repository. Um, people would send me patches via email. I would apply them to the source code in my home direct, you know, in my development directory, and then I would do these uh, tarball releases. And um, after we bought the house, my wife and I were really busy repairing plaster. The house was built in the '30s, so we were really, really busy repairing plaster, discovering that uh, um, they used horse everywhere in the house, like horse hair in the plaster, and then horse probably glue in the wallpaper and stuff like that. I'm, I, I don't want to speculate, but anyway. We, we got busy with that, and so I stopped working on the project. And that meant, since I was the source code repository, that meant the project stopped. And this went on for, I think, a few months. And finally, one of the developers tracked down my phone number. Please don't track down my phone number. There are other ways to reach the project nowadays. And he called me up and asked if I was going to work on the project. And this was a big wake-up call. This, um, you know, th th this informed me that there are people who are depending on this project, and they were making use of it, and I needed to support it the best way I could. And that's what I've kind of been doing with the project ever since. Um, at that time, the project was hosted on this, a Spark Station IPX. I bought a server. In fact, this is it. <laughs> is it not adorable? Um, anyway, yeah, I had all the all of our software installed on this, our web server and mail server, and and uh, you would be amazed at what you could fit in the 64 megs of RAM at the time. Um, yeah, but uh, I wish we could still do that sort of thing with software nowadays. But uh, in order to get this on the internet, I would go around to friends who worked at ISPs around town because you know I had a a professional network at the time. And I would trade consulting gigs to host, you know, to put this in a rack somewhere. And that worked great for a while, right up until the time that it stopped working. Um, because I would get a call from, you know, I'd put it in a rack somewhere, I'd get a call uh, you know, a couple months later from a, the friend that was helping me out, and he'd say, you know, we're being acquired and we're taking inventory right now, and your machine cannot show up on our inventory. So you got to come by and pick it up now. And so I would do that. And you know, there would be other situations where I'd have to go grab the box. I, I, I transported this under the cover of darkness more than once. So again, that worked great until it didn't. And so we went on to the next phase of the project. I, I just gave up and asked my boss. I asked my boss if we could host the project where I worked, and, and he was very gracious and said, yeah. And by that time, we'd outgrown this, so I bought another. I really liked Sun Hardware at the time. At, at that point, um, Sun Hardware was just really well made and, and, and great. But I uh, bought another Sun Workstation, moved everything over to that, and that worked really well. And that kind of started us on, on the path to how we hosted the project for a long time, because after, you know, at that point, 
we basically just hosted the project wherever I worked. And, and that was the case up until earlier this year when we switched everything over to the foundation. So if you run an open source project, you, you have needs that fall into one of these categories. You know, you need solid infrastructure. And that's, you know, what I learned with that machine. It, depending on what you do and how big your project is, you might need attorneys or accountants. Uh, you definitely need, you know, developers. You need to support them as best you can. Uh, depending on the complexity of your project, you might need educators to teach people how to use it and make the most use of it. And you, know, you need to serve your users, ultimately. And depending on the type of project you have, you, you know, you need these to varying degrees. You might not need some of these categories at all, but like, for instance, if you have an image processing library, you know, you kind of need infrastructure and you need developers, but developers are also your users. So, you know, you just kind of don't need, you don't need anything in this, these categories, you know, nearly to the extent of if you have, say, a drawing application, you know, you have a drawing application that might use this library, but you, you, you have needs, pretty strong needs in all these categories. And we, we kind of fall into this category here. We, we, we need infrastructure. Um, we're big enough and we have intellectual property, so we need attorneys. We also need accountants. We, we you know, need to support our, our pretty sizable development team, an active development team. We have to serve our educational community, um, which is well represented here today and this week. Um, and we need to support our users. So, as I mentioned, on this machine and, and the machine after it, I did everything myself in order to, to set up our infrastructure because that's what you had to do. There was just no other alternative. You know, nobody was going to do it for you. And so, you know, I set up a web server. I set up issue tracking. I set up, you know, a continuous integration server uh, so we can do automated builds and all this other stuff. And for release hosting, you know, sometimes the, the downloads for the project you used more bandwidth than we had at work. So I had to kind of find other places to host downloads for the project for a while, places like SourceForge and whatnot. Um, but if you compare that to today, if you set up an open source project today, it's easy. You just go to GitHub or GitLab. It takes a very short amount of time to set up an account there. And you just create a project, you, you know, that happens kind of instantly and they take care of everything for you. I, I can't stress enough what an effect GitHub and GitLab have had on the software industry and on the world in general, because they make it so easy to stand up an open source project and get it going and, and keep it hosted. And uh, they, since they've come out, there's kind of been this Cambrian explosion of, of open source projects. and. Uh, you know, that's just the world we live in today. And it's, I think it's a great and useful thing, but they, they take care of, you know, these two categories, your infrastructure and they serve your developers. They do you know, all these things that are, are necessary for those that aspects of the project. But the thing to keep in mind is that GitHub and GitLab will only give you stuff that they can automate. You know, GitHub and the GitLab, if you, you know, log into the web page, you get this little dashboard on the side that, you know, and you have, you can, select an issue tracker or, you know, look at the code repository or look at uh, pull requests. There is no button in GitHub and GitLab for an attorney, for an accountant. <laughs> um, and so, again, we, we've had to do stuff ourselves and uh, that's kind of where we'll be, you know, previous to what we do now, what we do now with the foundation, that's kind of where we depended on, on my employer. Um, it, it, Running this project has kind of been this sort of cat and mouse game of I have to do everything myself. Oh, great. I found a place that will, you know, do this for me. I have to do all these other things myself and, you know, just, you know, trying to keep up with the, the needs of the project. But yeah, there's, there's a ton of other stuff. If you have a sizable open source project, you, you know, if you have a logo or a trademark, you need an IP lawyer. Um, you also need an IP lawyer for questions about licensing because software you have a license and all your third party libraries have a license and there are other people who want to integrate with the code that have their license. And so you have questions about that, that need, you know, legal expertise. Um, in our case, Wireshark will show you what's on your network, but you have to know what's how those protocols that it's showing you works. And so we have to have some sort of educational, 
process or, or we have to make education available for people to make the best use of Wireshark. And so we have things like SharkFest and, and we partner with educators and so on. Um, and general technical support. You know, we, we have all these things that we've set up over the years to, to try to help users just, you know, with general questions from mailing lists to our question and answer site. We now have a Discord server and we have an issue tracker and so on. And, you know, that, that's stuff that requires a lot of manual intervention and, and, and um, you can't really automate a lot of it. So as it turns out, you need a business model. And uh, I kind of made up these names, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, the, the, the open source projects typically fall into one of these models. Uh, if you're small enough, you, you just don't have one. Um, we operated under what I call the corporate overlord model, where you know just ask your boss if you can list the project there. But there are also umbrella organizations, and you can set up an independent organization. And, and I'll talk about this in the next few slides. But I will say, if you can get away with it, if you're running an open source project, the best business model to have is none, because you don't have to spend any time on overhead for your project. But uh, you know we cannot get away with that. So yeah, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this slide, but. But it is a viable option for, for a lot of people, especially you know, if you go look on GitHub or GitLab, you know, you'll just see all these projects that just, you know, they just host on the project and that's it, and they have no other business model. But in our case, we have to we have to do these things. We have to make sure that the developers have the tools they need to work on Wireshark. Um, we need to make sure Wireshark is easy to obtain and install, which means that you know you have to go make it we, we you know, you have to have a download link that, that is reliable and, and we'll get you the, the installer pretty quickly and efficiently, or at least as we can. We also have to make sure that when you download Wireshark that your operating system doesn't complain about it. So we have to sign it, which means we have to buy code signing certificates and then get those deployed. And we have to make sure, you know, as I said previously, we need to make sure that you, the community has educational resources available and help available so that they can leverage Wireshark and, and make good use of it. So the way we've been doing that so far is to use a corporate overlord, um, use whoever I was working for at the time. And we've had four overlords over the years. The first one was a company called Network Integration Services. They, that was a consultant company I was, I was working at after the ISP. Um, but also Case Technologies and Riverbed and Sysdig. Um, Case and, and Sysdig kind of stand out uh, for a number of reasons. Case Technologies was um, a company I was asked to join in 2006, and I did. And uh, at Case, we, we did a lot of things that were very pivotal for the project. We developed um, Air PCAP and Pilot and, and the Shark Appliance and these other products that, that complemented Wireshark. We, we also changed, as you learned last night in the quiz, that's where we changed the name from Ethereal to Wireshark because network integration services, for whatever reason, they, we just couldn't come to an agreement on transferring the trademark. But you know, they're really nice people. Just we just couldn't reach that agreement. Um, the case was founded by the a couple of the authors of One PCAP, uh, Loris De Giovanni and John Luca Vareni. And the uh, case was also where we started Sharkfest. And as I said, that was very pivotal for the project. Case was so successful that in 2010 Riverbed acquired us, and that can you know they continued to host the project and 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 host Sharkfest. Uh, but in this after 2010, in this intervening time, Loris De Giovanni, who as I said was one of the WinPCAP authors and founded Case, he founded another company called Sysdig and asked me to join Sysdig in 2021, and so that's what I did. Sysdig took over as the project host as our new overlord and uh that's and they ultimately they, they did a lot of help to you know get the foundation started up sorry about with a boring history lesson but i needed to put a lot of stuff into context <laughs> so working in under corporate overlord was really convenient for me because I had, you know, attorneys and accountants and marketing people available that would help out with the project. But as great as that is, there are a couple of issues. Um, 
as it turns out, we, we kind of ended up with something the open source community calls it BDFL, which is, stands for Benevolent Dictator for Life, and that would be me. Um, even the, uh, you know, it, it's often the case that the, in an open source project that you end up with one person, usually the, the, the founder of the project, who just does everything and is legally allowed to do stuff for the project. Um, you know, the, the, the problem that we had working under the overlord model was that, that I was the only one that could go in and say, get code signing certificates or set up, you know, new services like at AWS on behalf of the project and do that legally. Um, so, yeah, I, I knew at some point that we needed to kind of delegate that out somehow. And, uh, you know, that, that's one of the issues that we needed to solve. Uh, having a primary sponsor is great, but at the same time, if that primary, if, if any of these companies had been purchased by, um, I don't want to name names, but let's say Oracle. <laughs> Somebody, some company that's famous for not treating open source very well. Um, we would have been in dire straits. And so, you know, that, that's a single point of failure that, that I was kind of worried about in the back of my head. Um, not all the time, but, but you know, it was certainly there. As a networking people, you know, we, we see these single points of failure and we just kind of have, have this visceral need to, to mitigate them, to work around them or, or eliminate them. By the way, this single point of failure was, I go on a bike ride each morning and that was a thumbtack that I picked up at some point and um, illustrated that my bike has a single point of failure on the front wheel. Um, but, uh, I managed to ride around for several days with the tire just slowly deflating before I realized that, you know, there's this chunk of metal in the tire. But uh, anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent. So if you want to move away from a corporate overlord, you have a couple of choices. You can join an umbrella organization or you can just go it, you know, go it alone. And uh, umbrellas are great. Uh, along with GitHub and GitLab, umbrella organizations have, have benefited open source uh, immensely. They, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about organizations like the Linux Foundation or the Apache you know, Foundation or the Software Freedom Conservancy. You, know, you have all these organizations that complement, they effectively complement GitHub and GitLab for large projects because they do take care of all the stuff that GitHub and GitLab won't automate. They, they give you access to accounting and legal services and uh, all sorts of other stuff that requires just a whole bunch of manual intervention that you can't really automate. The, we did talk to a couple of umbrellas uh, about moving over to them. Um, as it turns out, it, it didn't seem like a good fit for us um, for a couple of reasons. One was that in order for an umbrella to operate on your behalf, they have to own your IP assets. So we would have had to give up the trademark to Wireshark. And that was uh, something that a lot of the, the kind of leadership community had a, the, we had a lot of misgivings about that, let me put it that way. Um, but as it turns out, we, we kind of already had this organization built around us, an organization that, that ran conferences for us. And something that we learned that, uh, you know, umbrellas do, one of the things they do is they run their own conferences. And in a couple of cases, if we had joined an umbrella, we would have had to give up Sharkfest. And that was just kind of a, you know, that was a showstopper. That was kind of the end of the discussion there. And so, you know, we were kind of left with the last choice. And uh, that leads to another quote, uh, which is that Americans can be counted on to do the right thing after they've exhausted all of their possibilities. As this is attributed to Winston Churchill, but as far as anyone can tell, he never said this. It's just something that, um, well, Organic, it's a quote that organically evolved over time and then was organically kind of assigned to Winston Churchill. But, uh, um, but yeah, we, we kind of are down to the last choice here, which is to set up an independent organization for the project. And that's what we did. We incorporated in the state of California as a public benefit corporation. Um, we applied for 501c3 status with the IRS. Um, if you're in the US, you probably see, you know, this these numbers and letters all the time, 51C3, and nobody ever explains what that is. 51C3 is a section of the U.S. tax code. And it's a section that says, okay, if you're incorporated in a specific way and you have these stated goals, 
uh, you know, that, that state that you're working towards the public benefit and you can demonstrate that you benefit the public, then we will grant you 51C3 status. And that means that um, among other things that, that people can donate to you and they can d deduct those donations from your taxes in the US. Um, that, that's at least, that's the main thing that people on the outside look at. I mean, on the inside, there, there are a bunch of other benefits, but uh, this is, well, A, we're up and running at the wiresharkfoundation.org, but this is a, a scan of the letter that the IRS sent, um, which granted us 501c3 status. And this was at the end of a very long process where we had to fill out this huge application form. And I remember the day we got this letter, I just kind of sat there for, uh, I don't know how long, holding it in my hands, just staring at it and, and disbelief that we'd finally gotten where we needed to go. So under the foundation, we have a goal to help as many people as possible understand their networks as much as possible. We might expand on that a little bit over time and you know help in other areas where, with low level analysis, but this is the goal right now. And, the, um, and right now we're focused on you know, getting Sharkfest, you know, continuing to offer Sharkfest and, and getting it going and, and, you know, just growing the community as much as we can. There are a bunch of benefits to running things under our own independent nonprofit. Uh, we ensure that the project has sustainable funding and governance. Uh, we can explore more ways to help, it, you know, and educate users and, uh, and just grow the community. So the foundation is made up of these people, Sherry, I guess she's out front, but she is our executive director. Angela is our technical director. I'm the CFO, and uh, rounding out the board, we have uh, Janice, Lori Stejuani, who I mentioned earlier, and Hansang Bay, who uh, he often speaks at Sharkfest. He's a very prominent member of the community. Under Unfortunately, he couldn't make it this time around, but, uh, but he is on the board as well. Um, this project's been around for a long time and we're just now getting around to setting up a foundation. So what, you know, it, it's a fair question. Fair, it is perfectly fair to ask what took so long. And, and a lot of it has to do with them, the fact that I'm a little bit lazy. I mean, it was very comfortable just letting my employer take care of everything. I knew, you know, those days would come to an end eventually. And, uh, but, it, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll blame the pandemic, everybody else does. Um, <laughs> But yeah, Cystic and Riverbed especially, they made things very convenient uh, as far as running the project and, and hosting the, the conference. Um, and, and some changes are kind of one way. If you, you know, if, if you transfer IP assets like trademarks and stuff and logos to a nonprofit, it's, it's not impossible, but as I understand it, uh, it's very difficult to get those back out if say we changed our minds and wanted to go with a for-profit enterprise, but uh, um, I do believe that this is the right choice and that it's going to help the project and, and, uh, and continue to grow the project. So I'm really happy about this. Um, we are at a point in the talk where it's probably beneficial to bring the developers up so I can save my voice. We got Uh, hello everyone, my name is Ron Knall. I'm one of the co-developers. I'm from Austria. I've uh, been with the project since... I've been developing for Wireshark since 2014, been a co-developer since 2016. Main focus is UI these days. Uh, and yeah. Hi everybody, my name is Pascal Quentin. I'm from France. I started contributing to Wireshark in 2008, I think, and joined as a core developer in 2012. Uh, I'm mostly on the telecom business. Uh, Anders Broman. I am joined the project 2003, I think. Maybe 2005 I became a core developer. I don't quite remember anymore. Uh, also in the telecom industry, working mainly with uh, protocols associated with that. And also looking at merge requests and these kind of things in the project. Hi, Dan Musak. Look, I'm from the Netherlands also, or also like Peter. Um, I started using Ethereal back in, I think, around 2000. And I was missing features, so first I wanted to ask for something. And then I thought, it's open source, let's see if I can develop it myself which I did, and it was a 
think about 2006 and in 2007 I was asked to join the core team and that kind of steered off my career as well becoming independent a troubleshooter and giving trainings and stuff so yeah. I'm Martin Matheson I've been a core developer since 2006 I think I've mostly worked on telecoms protocols most of the sectors I've been concentrating on and in fact I'm doing a talk tomorrow about well, it would let you know a bit more about how the sectors work and how we can help you make them better if, if you want to write some. Uh, hi there. Uh, I'm Peter, uh, also from the uh, Netherlands. Uh, typically, I work on TLS, HP, Quick, uh, all kind of uh, protocols that I they run into and that bothers me. And uh, if I fix it, I can also help others at it. So that's nice. Uh, John Packer. I using Wireshark for a long time. I guess I made some small contributions about 10 years ago, but started doing a lot more the last couple of years. Been a core developer past year and a half. Um, and I'm pretty much interested in almost anything in Wireshark that catches my attention, so. Uh, my name is Chuck Kraft. Um, spending my retirement answering questions on the Q&A website. Uh, core developer since Kansas City last year, and um, you asked about mistakes. The biggest mistake I could make would be not to thank my wife right now. So, thank you to my <laughs> wife Anne um, for indulging me and letting me do this in my retirement. So, did anyone have any questions or? Question. Question. Uh, and just curious, I, such a small group and Wireshark is so incredibly popular, you know, million downloads a week, you know, everybody, everybody is sued. Uh, I'm just curious if you know, like the percentage, you know, like how much code you guys write versus how, how big is the development community out there that's can also contributing to watch. Um, I have stats on the next slide. <laughs> But uh, um, I think we've gotten contributions from two, over 2,000 people. I can't remember the exact number. But uh, yes. There's some core developers who are too. Yeah, yeah. This is not the entire core developer team. But to be fair, we don't really know the number of core developers by hand who are active because, yeah. you know, people drop off, jobs change, their life changes. And so yeah. some people stop contributing for whatever reasons. I think at any given time, we're about 14, 15 people in the core developer team. Uh, and there are a lot of people who are de facto on the same status, but not contributing code per se. For instance, people like Jasper, who does quite a lot for Wireshark and Wireshark community, uh, but he not yet has some similar status, but he's definitely considered by us as a core developer. I mean, he gets all the same spam mail we get. <laughs> Yeah, how do you guys collaborate across the community when there's major changes taking place? <laughs> You're assuming a level of coordination that might not exist. <laughs> no, um, when somebody wants to make a really major change, we you know we do have a developer mailing list, and we have other areas where we can make have discussions, and and so they'll kind of propose their idea, and the you know the the ultimate decider is is the code itself. So you know they'll they'll make a merge request and make you know probably market a draft and and kind of you know invite discussion that way and go from there. I was I was laughed at at Carnegie Mellon for phrasing it like we fix the things that bug us. So if you bug us, we fix the things that bug you, <laughs> which is pretty much how we operate most of the time. Uh, I think everyone here is familiar with other open source projects and the conflicts they have. We are very, very lucky that we stayed far away of those kind of conflicts for a very long time. There is an occasional mix up, there is occasional bumping heads, but it's not, it never got to that level of, of confrontation. Uh, that being said, usually how the project is organized, there are parts of the project where a specific core developer has predominance. Uh, he either developed it or he maintained it for the past years. 
And so if you venture into that area, you usually send him a short email, I want to do this, so I want to do that, if it's a major change. If it's not, you just submit the merge request, hope he sees it, or in some cases, hope he doesn't. Uh, <laughs> I'd hope it goes through because, before somebody else screams. Uh, in this regard, our development cycle helps us out a lot because we have uh, internal testing, we have uh, fast testing, so when we develop a new protocol, when somebody else develops something, we always ask, and some of you who might have sent in bug reports, one of the prominent questions you get is, please attach a PCAP with the arrow to that. The reason for that is it lands in our fastest menagerie, and then we can automatically test with that PCAP code that has been written. So a lot of things, a lot of stability comes from that fact. Um, but yeah, well, to explain fuzz testing, fuzz in our case, fuzz testing means that 24 hours a day, there is a machine that's trying to break Wireshark. Yeah. And so when we ask for a capture file, what we do is we take those captures and inject errors into them and try to get the dissectors to be, not behave very well. And uh, we can detect when they crash or you know cause problems and yeah. uh, fix them. But yeah, whenever conflict arises, I would say 99% of the cases, we are all adults and we manage to solve it ourselves. There's one or two conflicts over the past years where Gerald or somebody else stepped in as mediator and said, okay, let's talk this out. But besides that. Um, I had a question in the back. Uh, as far as the roadmap goes, uh, uh, unfortunately, okay. I, I, I ostensibly work on Wireshark full time. I'm not paid to do that. And, and some of the other developers up here are, are paid to support Wireshark within their company, but they work for their company. They don't work for me. So I can't say, okay, I, I can't, you know, plant a flag and say, okay, we're going to be working on this for the next six months. I just can't do that. I can't, I don't have anybody to assign work to. And so we, we don't, you know, we kind of have a very informal roadmap and, and kind of, have a rough idea of where we want things to go and what needs to be fixed. But, uh, um, you know, it gets worked on when, when people have time to work on it. Uh, and as far as becoming a core developer, you know, if you make useful contributions and, and do that over some period of time, you know, ultimately we'll, you know, somebody will pipe up and say, Hey, you know, this person's doing a great job. Why don't we invite them? And, and, you know, we just have an internal vote and go with that. We will probably formalize that process soon. We have to. Yes. Uh, regarding the roadmap, uh, because when you go through the GitLab project, you might stumble across that we already created a milestone Wireshark 5.0. There is no version 5.0 plan. It's just, there are some things that really annoy us during development and we want to break stuff. And whenever we want to break stuff, we do a major release. Because it's for most people, it's either you have to change configuration, you have to change a little bit how you think. For instance, with 4.0, we changed the syntax of the display filters, which broke a lot of people's documentation, books, stuff like that. So whenever we want to really break stuff because it helps us developing Wireshark, then we make a new major version. So we already started a milestone and added issues to that, which are falling into that category. That being said, there is no roadmap for a 5.0. There is no roadmap for a 4.2, 4.4, 4.6. It's just whenever we, we or Gerald in particular feels we reach the level of maturity or a level of feature sets that would allow us to say, okay, this is really a new version, then we release one. Um, you can always use the development version, by the way. It's stable enough. It's being used in productive environments quite well. You just run into the occasional TLS error because somebody fixed something that didn't work afterwards. Not looking at Peter. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Gerald and uh, Roland already mentioned um, there's not a like formal roadmap, but there might be things that uh, bother uh, that bother us that like limit what we can do. Uh, but there are also external factors such as a new version of the Qt, Qt uh, user interface toolkit. Uh, eventually, we might have to like support new versions, so we have to prepare the code base in order to do that. And 
um, some people might like be interested in it and like try to like work together to you know like move move over to it. And uh, there might also be like new protocol developments, for example, Quick or Tails 1.3. Uh, during the standardization process, um, some of us who were interested in it uh, started like working on it and trying to make sure that it's like kept up to date as new developments go. But that's very much like well driven by I guess individuals that know like big picture roadmap. That the individuals might have interests uh, and if they have time they can work on it. But yeah, if, if you are like working certain protocols and really feel that Wireshark is uh, missing something, feel free uh, to contribute. We're more than welcome. Uh, we probably have time for one or two more questions. I have like two more slides I need to go over. Do you ever think about like making Wireshark like uh, like like charging? Nope. <laughs> Um, uh, can I? Uh, to be quite fair, uh, one of the, as a consensus, when we, cre when we created the Wireshark Foundation, there was one consensus and this consensus was adamant with all core developers. There is never going to be a paid version of Wireshark. There is never going to be sponsorship within the program. That being said, there could be sponsorship in the installer. There could maybe be a sponsorship page on, in the app help or about the dialogue, but there will never be a Wireshark version which includes ads and there will never be a Wireshark version that you have to pay for. We are open source. We are committed to open source and open source for us is free as beer and that's how we do it. Um, anyone else? <laughs> oh, I forgot to, uh, for, uh, one thing about the roadmap. So if you want to know what's like coming up, you can also check the release notes, uh, for like, uh, uh and development versions. There are various, uh, pre-release versions like RC0, RC1 and so on. Uh, in there you can also see, uh, see what's upcoming. And if you really want to get into the details, there are also like, yeah, merge requests open on GitLab, there are Git logs and so on, but yeah. they might be a bit hard for you to do like a work through. There was one question over here. Yep. Right. Zero holders. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, my first Wireshark was Sharkfest 2016 in Arnheim, and that was the first time I got that question. Um, we continue to get that question because since we moved to Qt. Uh, no, there is no mobile version of Wireshark. The reason for that is manifold, starting with the UI, which isn't transportable, starting with a lot of other stuff that's not going well with mobile platforms in, a, in ever. Uh, there are versions you can use on a mobile platform like CloudJerk with similar uh, installations. And when you have, uh, when you <laughs> when you visit Megumi-san's class, she will happily show you her version of Wireshark on a very tiny Windows PC, which you can also use for a mobile installation. <laughs> that being said, I think redesigning the UI and integrating a mobile version is on the roadmap forever. And as soon as somebody pays me half a million dollars to work on that for two years, there might be a version for it. So if any of you had a little bit of pocket change, we'd glad to take it. But yeah, no, there is not. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, uh, Wireshark has been like compiled for like to run on Android and so on. So technically there's like a mobile version for it, but like Roman said, like the user interface is so much different. Um, there are also alternatives. You could like use uh, some, uh, 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 like, um, uh, web application. Like there are some various uh, front ends for Wireshark as a web application, but then, uh, yeah, uh, you don't have like a local capture, but yes, you have an interface, but it's also like not as nice to use what we would expect from a mobile application. And one addition to that and combining that with a roadmap, um, since it's an open source project and everybody works on it voluntarily, everything that people want to develop gets developed. But if nobody wants to develop a certain feature, it doesn't get developed. There's no paid development, at least not yet. Maybe if the foundation gets enough money for it, we can uh, do paid development, hire people to do stuff. 
but as long as that's not there, it's just uh, the itches that everybody crashes uh, for themselves and for the community and not really a roadmap on any big features like a wireless, uh, like a mobile app or just like that. Yeah. Um, I'm also wondering what is the use case? Why would you want it in the first place? To, to be quite fair, um, the operating system that most likely would succeed in performing a good platform would be probably iOS because they are Android to some extent as well, but Android has a few issues with, with handling network communication internally. iOS has now a dedicated network path which would allow you to integrate drivers, network drivers with the latest version. No one has yet released it, and the one thing you need is still not released. It's going to be in the next iOS release. Um, that being said, yeah, I can think of use cases like walking through a data center that wanted to get a quick, a quick capture out of a switch or walking through uh, to, to an AP and want to do a capture there and stuff like that. Use cases, you use a laptop right now, but most of remote workers, an iPad is more sufficient, a tablet is more sufficient. I fully get the use case. It's just, you know, we're an open source project. We're not a company-led project. And therefore, if no one pays us to do it, you have to take what we take in our free time, which is how many lines of code do we have? Oh, there is a slide for that. Let's get to that. Yeah, We get... Uh, I've been saying for a long time we get more than a million downloads a month, and we're actually closer to 1.5 now. As you might imagine, the vast majority are for Windows, but uh, a good chunk are for Mac OS. We, we have a sizable Mac user community. Is, you know, if you look at a lot of the developer laptops and like mine, you'll see an Apple logo. Um, well, <laughs> you have to pay attention to this. The, these are the downloads amounts on the servers we manage. Um, we don't host any, well, I have no idea what Linux you know, what the number is for Linux distributions because they s serve up their own Wireshark packages. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm sure that number is much higher. It's just some, these are numbers we don't have access to. Um, you know, we support, we're coming up on 3,000 protocols, um, almost 250,000 display filter fields. The stat that I love is that we've gotten contributions from over 2,000 authors, and that's just um, something that kind of keeps me energized and going. And I, I've no, I really have no idea how many lines of code we have in the project um, um, because there are different utilities you can run that will count the lines of code. And they count them in different ways. And one of the different ways is whether or not you have automatically generated code or not. You know, it might count, it might not. So depending on whether you count automatically generated code, we have quite a bit. We have somewhere between three and six million lines of code. So, yeah, that's really precise. But anyway, um, one final thing. This happened. This is a Wireshark installer screen for ARM64 on Windows. And that's something I've been working on for a little bit. And hopefully we the, the thing keeping us right now from offering downloads for this is spinning up a build server. And that's something that I hopefully can focus on in the next couple of weeks. Um, I, well, we used up all our question time, sorry. Um, like I said, we'll be done with the developer doing. A uh, couple of final things. One, we're almost 25. The project, the official birthday of the project is July 14th, 1998, because that's when I made the very first release of Ethereal on that machine right there. Uh, so what does that mean for you? I think it means we're going to have cake. I need to verify that with Sherry. But <laughs> finally, I wanted uh, two things. I wanted to say that if you ever want to start a project, do not be afraid to do that. And don't be afraid to make mistakes, as I said. Um, and if you see somebody that has started a project you're interested in, don't be afraid to, to contribute and help them out. Uh, you might end up changing the world. Um, but I, I, I want to say thank you. First of all, if you're wondering about the picture, um, I do, my main hobby on the weekends is to go road biking. And I might do a short bite about that. I don't know. But anyway, I'm out in the Central Valley of California baking in the summer sun, riding past farm animal, animals that are hanging out in the shade. And if you 
take those two facts, you can come to a conclusion. The conclusion is, I'm dumber than livestock. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I put this up to illustrate the fact that Wireshark is a great and wonderful thing, and it's not because of me. It's because of all of you, because of the developer and user and educator communities. And so I just wanted to say thank you. Thank <laughs> you.